Moms are saints, angels by merely existing. No one could possibly understand what it's like to be a mom. Men will never understand. Women with no children will never understand. No one but moms know the hardship of motherhood. And we non-moms must heap nothing but praise upon moms. Because we, lowly, pitiful non-moms, are mere peasants compared to the goddesses we call mothers. Hi, I am Dr. Kim Sage, and I'm a licensed psychologist, and I'm just, I'm glad you're here. I wanted to share that quote from Jeanette McCurdy's book because reading it last week, alongside not feeling super great, kind of threw me into a multiple day, sort of a flashback, to be honest, um, a regression into this true feeling state, which really is the heart of an emotional flashback, into what it felt like to be engulfed and suffocated and consumed by the damage of a mother relationship that was defined by enmeshment and trauma bonding. And Jeanette's book, while there are lots of things about it that are just really validating and, and really, I think, for so many people, you may not have had that version of a mom, but if you read a book like that and you feel what it feels like for someone like Jeanette, I would say there's a very good chance you experience some kind of parental trauma. And I want to talk about the true damage that it does, the poison, the toxin, the, the thing that it does to us at the core. And there are many different versions of, of wounding by parents. But in this instance, we're talking about enmeshment at the core and trauma bonding, I believe, that really create this dynamic where there's you and the parent, the mother in the situation. And the damage that it does, I think is incredibly important to understand. Coco just is getting close to my camera. I need to move it in one second. Oh my love, come here. For some reason, she always wants to get behind the camera every time I start, <laughs> I start filming. Okay, back to my important serious topic. Um, I'm only in this place of laughter because for honestly several days I couldn't get out of it and it made me really kind of try to analyze and break down what was happening. So let's talk about quickly enmeshment and trauma bonding and then we're going to get to what those things do to us and what we need to do to heal. Enmeshment is really, like I said, it's about a boundaryless dynamic between parent and child where the child exists to serve the emotional, physical, mental, whatever needs of the parent. There is no separation between I'm a healthy little child and there's a hierarchy and a boundary and you're the parent. The child serves to rotate around the parent. And it almost feels like as if the parent can't breathe without the child in some way. Now in Jeanette's book, she sort of tapped into Jeanette as the female child to provide a fantasy of living her own dream, the mother's dream of, of being an actor potentially and put Jeanette into acting as a young child and kind of forced her into it and then continued to that all, all kind of played out. And Jeanette, as all children do, want to please their mothers, their fathers, their parents. And so this becomes something that we just do and yet we end up paying these huge, this huge price for. So at the heart of enmeshment, we're talking about existing to serve the parent. Now that can play out. I have a video here you might want to watch that talks more about enmeshment. But then we have this idea of trauma bonding and at the heart of trauma bonding are really two main factors. Number one, a power imbalance. And I mean, just by nature of its existence, a parent and child have a power imbalance. And there should be a hierarchy where the child is under the parent and is safe, but that's not what's happening, right? In enmeshment, the child is being pulled into the parent's world in every, in every situation for the most part. Maybe they're the parent's best friend. Maybe the parent dumps their trauma about their childhood or their marriage or whatever, and the, child's ex the child is expected to emotionally help the parent get back on track. And so in a trauma bond, you have, like I said, a power imbalance and you have the cyclical nature of like abuse and the, and the cycle of abuse. 
in that you have this intermittent reinforcement. And in terms of behavioral schedules of reinforcement, this is one of the most addictive. It's like playing the slots. You're gonna win, you're gonna lose. You're gonna win, you're gonna lose. At some point you will win, but you will also lose. But that win keeps you in the game because you never know when you might win next. So you keep playing, right? Now, as a child, we're in the trauma bond because we have no choice. We, this is our only source of survival. And at the heart of a trauma bond, is, especially as it can play out in more extreme types of parents, is that it's that heart of disorganization, that type of attachment pattern where the source of safety, the parent, is also the source of fear. And so the child will always try to choose the attachment. That's why kids who are often removed from the home from horrible situations want to go back home. I mean, there's lots of reasons why, I believe, from an evolutionary and biology and attachment perspective. But a child is wired to try to get that love and that attachment in some way. And so that, because of that nature, of it's not always bad. Sometimes I get what I call good love from this parent where I'm sometimes safe, or maybe I just, maybe in a narcissistic parent, it's just like I get positive reinforcement when I do what they want me to do and now I'm valuable. But then the next day they will be critical and abusive and hurtful. But two days from that, I'm like the shining star because I, you know, kicked the scoring, um, the winning score in a game or something, right? So you have trauma bonding, which keeps us in it. And this obviously happens in adult relationships as well. And I would argue that you probably aren't gonna be in a trauma bond as an adult if there wasn't some form of trauma bonding or dysfunctional attachment in your childhood. And so we start to carry these mothers inside. We have all this damage we carry because they are our mothers and yet they treated us this way, but they also said they loved us or they did love us but the love was poisonous, toxic, damaged love. And unfortunately for so many of us, it's not until years later, like I said, that we understand this. So what is the impact on your life? What is, to tr what is the true damage in terms of this enmeshed trauma bonded dynamic, especially in a story like Jeanette's? There are lots of places where it damages us, but the three main ones I really wanna focus on are number one, your nervous system. And I know I say this all the time, but here's what I'm talking about. Because your nervous system was so up and down and in that fight or flight stage, the thing you're always seeking in every scenario is safety. Safety in your body, meaning a more calm place, safety in relationships, whatever it is. And so you often spend your life in lifelong emotional dysregulation trying to get to safety, right? Trying to choose partners, trying to control your substances, using substances. I mean, like a food disorder. You know, even Jeanette talks about through her disorder, there was a sense of calm at some point in the process, which is very common. And so what you're really trying to do is regulate yourself because you are lifelong dealing with this dysregulation. And that really is a way that it kind of manifests is then you become hyper fixated and hyper focused on whatever it will take. And like I've said, that can include a million different things, substances, addictions, relationships, numbing, um, disorders, whatever it takes to try to get there. And so the core of that is you spend your life trying to seek safety, but oftentimes because, especially if you, were, if you remain unaware, not healed, you're often in the same situations time and time again with friends, bosses, coworkers, colleagues, partners for sure, but deep inside you are unsafe. And that is what you're trying to find. That's the thing you didn't get in childhood. Number two, is your relationship with yourself and sort of your identity. It's so clear in these situations, especially in enmeshment and trauma bonding, that you didn't have a safe place, sorry the trash truck's going by, to allow yourself to develop a separate self. Your dreams had to be their dreams or their vision. And so you often don't know who you are at the core. And it, you might be successful, you might not, you might be struggling, you might not, but deep inside, it's like there's this vacancy about who you really are and what matters to you, what makes you, you. And so the struggles there can become, well, I, I do have a sense of meaning and identity when I'm a people pleaser, when I'm a compulsive caretaker. I get meaning from, from being what you want me to be. And so that becomes the template for the rest of the world and relationships. And that can play out in some really difficult, difficult ways. Because if you don't know who you are, then you can't you know, decide what your morals are, your boundaries are, your belief systems are, what you will accept, what you won't. 
And so that can obviously play out in a lot of difficult and toxic ways for you. And lastly, really your lifelong issue is about trusting human beings. And then that plays out, I think, also, of course, in your attachment patterns. It's attachment and our nervous system is really kind of like meet together, right? As our little baby selves come out of the situation we're born into and try to quickly start to respond to our caregivers' nervous system patterns and to their attachment patterns. And so what I'm talking about also is that at the core, if you never got to be safe in your emotional self and physical self or otherwise, then you don't really trust people deep down inside often. And so you might do things in an attachment pattern to cling to them, to be afraid you'll lose them because you're, they're giving you a sense of meaning, but you don't ever really trust that they won't leave you. Or you feel avoidant, you're more avoidant, where you just you let people get only so close and then there's a wall. And then I would say that I think is true for most of us. There's this, especially with, if we have childhood trauma, that we are even though we, we may not live our lives in a disorganized way, we might be fairly put together and functional, deep inside there's a chaos and a lack of consistency and safety about what relationships look and feel like inside for us. And so that can manifest in both anxious and avoidant patterns. Now, what do you want to do to heal this? The main things are to focus on your clearly learning to deal with your body, your nervous system, all the stuff around polyvagal theory, polyvagal therapies, you know, learning how to calm and soothe through somatic therapy or meditations, yoga, guided, guided meditations, affirmations, whatever it takes for you to just get your body calm. And for many of us, that looks like a generalized anxiety disorder. We are in hypervigilance all the time. So really looking at how to calm and soothe your body. Number two, reparenting. I know I say this a lot too, but learning how to deal with, and I have a course on this, as most of you know, but I really believe you, you are the inner child and now you're the parent. But if both of those didn't get healthy messages, how do you even give love to the inner child if the parent you've internalized is a wounded, damaged, toxic parent? The next one is emotions work. Looking at do you numb emotions? Do you, do you not honor your feelings? Do you overfeel? Looking at how you deal with your feelings and healthier ways to manage and express those. Identity work, looking at who am I? What what do I believe? I have this in my um, course on the parenting course from being, a, not parenting, the course on borderline and narcissistic parents, there's a section on identity work because I think we often, like I said, don't know who we are. You wanna look at your fear of conflict and anger and potential avoidance around self-advocacy and, self, and self-expression because if you had an enmeshed parent relationship and trauma bond, it's pretty sh I'm pretty sure you weren't allowed to really have an opinion in a separate self, or maybe you did and you fought a lot, it was chaotic, but there was never any real integration and, and like um, safe reciprocity there. And then lastly, you wanna obviously work on communication skills, how to express yourself, how to set boundaries. Sorry, my computer's not turned off. Looking at your numbing patterns, understanding kind of where all this stuff comes from. I think that's really powerful. We don't wanna stay in that. But I think when you have the knowledge, it gives you power to say, oh, that's that thing I do where I was, where I shut down when I feel overwhelmed or whatever. And then lastly, you want to, of course, get, you know, therapy, podcasts, books, resources, courses, whatever it takes to support your journey, because it's not so simple as just reading about it in a book. I think, I think you have to live it and practice it. And the last thing is to really develop some type of self-care, self-compassion plan. And I'm not talking about making a massage appointment or um, you know, just taking a walk, although those things are self-care. I'm talking about seeing yourself as worthy because the thing that struck me with that, that reading that book is it put me into this emotional regression where I felt that feeling of suffocation. That's all, I, I just felt that weight. I'm so many years now into no contact that I haven't had that feeling where I feel like I'm responsible for how she feels and what she thinks and does, even if she's a thousand miles away or across the street. Just that it, it felt like a thousand pound weight on my chest every day, all of the time. And if, the, if things were good, that was great. I could kind of feel like, oh, I'm in that glow, but like that, it could change. And that like that is why I ended up after almost 50 years going no contact. Um, and I had to do it with a therapist. I don't know that I could have done it by myself, but what I realized through listening to and reading a little bit more about that interview with Jeanette and Drew Barrymore and also reading the book is that it just really made me feel like that feeling of 
that weight and it, I just couldn't shake it for a few days. It was, I was like back in it and that is how I felt all of the time. And that was the hypervigilance that determined everything else I did in every single relationship, how I saw myself, whether I was entitled to setting boundaries, it's why I chose a narcissist. I mean, it's just so many things about that that I realized it took me so much longer than I wish it had taken me to realize that um, I didn't get a chance to develop really who I was and it took longer than I wished, but I am glad I'm here. I'm still developing every day and growing and regressing some days and moving forward just like you are. But I just wanna honor that it is important to understand there is a true damage and toxicity to having parents like this. And it, it, it you can climb your way out of it but it is a process and it takes time and you deserve love and healing and support as you do it. So I hope you found this video helpful. If you are new here, I would love for you to join this little growing community. Please feel free to subscribe and also check out my links down below. There are three courses. One's a free course and two more kind of courses, which if what I talked about today resonates for you, then it really is something that I would love for you to check out at least in the minimum. And lastly, I'm thinking about developing an attachment healing, like a masterclass, and I would love to hear your thoughts on that. So I'm going to start working on that. If I do it, there are already some great attachment resources, but most of you know I have a real passion for that too. So please let me know your thoughts about that, and if so, what you would really want to you know, work on and understand and learn. So thank you so much for being here. Please stay safe and well, and I'll see you next week. Take care. Bye.